Good morning, everyone. Today we're going to pick up on Acts uh, chapter 4, and we're going to look at uh, just a few verses. We're going to look at chapter um, chapter 4, verses 32 to 37. But uh, before we begin our study, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear, we thank you for this time of fellowship this morning. We are thankful that we can um, enjoy this present freedom, that we can be good stewards of the time that you give to us, and that we can assemble together in fellowship, song, in prayer, and in the study of your word. And Lord, we pray this morning as we take this time to consider your word that we will be sensitive to the uh, illuminating ministry of the Holy Spirit who helps us to understand the biblical text. Father, we pray that we will be challenged by these things that we might grow thereby. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. So in the previous section uh, that Leon had covered last week in Acts chapter 4, verses 13 through 31, uh, we saw where the Sanhedrin had evaluated Peter and John, whom they had regarded as uneducated men, and after asking them to leave the council briefly, began to discuss how a noteworthy miracle had been performed in Jerusalem that was witnessed by many. The Sanhedrin were impressed by their confidence and recognized that they had been with Jesus. And despite being, uh, being ordered to stop preaching about Jesus, Peter and John uh, refused to obey and continued to preach. And this shows that some acts of civil disobedience are required by God's people when the civil authorities command something that is contrary to the will of God. And after Peter and John left the council, they reported their encounter to their companions, and they all prayed together for boldness and were filled with the Holy Spirit. And the last thing that we're told by Luke in that section, in that pericope, is that the place uh, where they prayed shook. And this is a sign of God's approval. And they continued to speak the word of God uh, with confidence. And, uh, and so now we're going to move on in our next section and finish out just the last few verses of this chapter. In Acts 4.32, uh, we read, And the congregation of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and not one of them claimed that anything belonging to him was his own, but all things were common property to them. Now this newly formed group of believers experienced a radical change of heart, and Luke tells us that they were of one heart and soul, cardia kai psuche mia, uh, is how the Greek reads, uh, one heart and soul. Now, the word heart here from the Greek word cardia does not refer to the physical organ, uh, but according to Badag, refers to the center and source of the whole inner life with its thinking, feeling, and volition. Now, the New Testament use of the word soul, here, psuche, from which we get the word, and we bring it into the English, like in the word psychology, but the New Testament usage of, the, of soul, psuche here, uh, is sometimes difficult to distinguish from the heart, from cardia, as it too can refer to the inner life of a person and its various faculties. Uh, but when combined together, the heart and soul denotes the common mind that caused the church to be united at the deepest human level. Now the result of this was an abandonment really of self and self-interest. Uh, as we're told that not one of them claimed that anything belonging to him was his own, but that all things were common property to them. And so here we witness an outward behavior that reflects a transformed heart. Now, God continued to work through his apostles. As Luke tells us in Acts 4.33, it says, And with great power the apostles were giving testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and abundant grace was upon them all. Now, the main purpose of the apostles was witnessing for Jesus. That was their primary uh, function here. And their witness came with great power, dunamē. We uh, dunamē megale is the Greek, and dunamē is the word for power. Uh, we energy. We bring it into the English, like in the word dynamite. Uh, but their witness came with great power, which, considering the context, refers to miracles that God was performing through them. And, of course, the miracles were not really ends in themselves. That's not the purpose of the miracles, but were intended to serve as a testimony for the Lord Jesus, 
specifically concerning his resurrection from the dead. So the apostles were not pointing to others, uh, were not pointing others to themselves. They were not doing these miracles uh, or God doing the miracles through them and then saying, look at me. Uh, but they were actually pointing people to Jesus because that was the point of it. So true Christian ministry always starts with Jesus. And referencing, it's interesting because they, they reference only the resurrection. And referencing only the resurrection seems to be a form of evangelistic shorthand that by implication assumes what? His death and his burial. I mean, you can't have a resurrection without a death, right? Uh, so again, it seems to be a form of evangelistic shorthand that by implication assumes Jesus' death and burial. For again, one cannot have resurrection without the former events, and when taken together communicates really the core of the gospel message. Jesus here is called Lord, from the Greek word kurios. And uh, this is really a reference to his divinity. Now, the Bible presents Jesus as God. There's a number of references that are very clear on this. Without question, he's presented as God. John 1.1, 1, 1, John 1.14, 1, John 20.28, 20, uh, Hebrews chapter 1. I mean, you have so many references to the deity of Christ. It's, it's amazing that anybody could teach otherwise. Uh, but the Bible presents Jesus as God. And in the Old Testament... For example, the proper name of God is Yahweh, and we see that in the four letters that make up the proper name of God, the yod heh vav -He, what's referred to as the Tetragrammaton, and is translated Lord, all in capital letters. Uh, at least that's how our friends at the NASB uh, translate it. Now, when the Septuagint was written around 250 BC, uh, which is the Greek translation of the Hebrew Old Testament, the translators chose uh, the Greek word kurios, as a suitable substitute for the Hebrew name Yahweh. And though the word is sometimes used in the New Testament to, to mean sir or master, it is also used to refer to the deity of Jesus. For example, you think of in John the Baptist, in John 1, where John is pointing to Jesus, but John says of himself what? He says, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness, make straight the way of the who? Of the Lord. Well, who's he talking about? He's talking about Jesus. And there he uses the Greek word kurios. What's interesting is if you go back and you look at Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3, where, where John is lifting this passage, uh, the word Lord there is the, is the tetragrammaton. It's the proper name of God, Yahweh. So clearly taking this passage that speaks of Yahweh and applying it to Jesus. So again, it's just one of a number of passages that clearly point to the deity of Christ, and that's how the word is understood here. And we are also told that abundant grace was upon them all. And grace is a word that appears 17 times in the book of Acts. I'll talk about that a little bit later because I love the subject of grace. And, of course, it appears uh, uh, about 155 times in the, in the Greek New Testament. And if I remember correctly, Paul gobbles up that, about 130 usages of that word. And Paul is a big, big grace man. I forget the exact number, but that's a, a rough guesstimate. But we're told that abundant grace was upon them all. And grace generally refers to the unmerited favor or kindness that one person freely confers on another uh, without regard to the beauty or worth of the object. Grace has more to do really with the heart of the giver who blesses others from the bounty of his or her own goodness. And again, as I mentioned a, word, a moment ago, the word grace appears 17 times in the book of Acts and commonly denotes uh, throughout, uh, really a divine enablement to perform a task which gives success to the ones so blessed. You see this concept of divine enablement like when we think of like Paul in 2 Corinthians 12, 7 through 10, where he has his thorn in the flesh, and Paul does what any believer would do. He prays three times for God to take it away, right? He says, I beg the Lord. In fact, it was a really quite intense form of prayer, uh, but God tells him no. And, of course, we understand from that principle that what God does not remove, he intends for us to deal with, and this by faith. But he tells Paul, he says, my grace is sufficient for you for powers perfected in weakness. And, and, and in that context, like we'll see in Acts in a number of references, uh, it refers to divine enablement. It means that God gives the believer what is needed to perform the task. And it's always sufficient for the moment. I mean, Paul, God tells Paul, my grace is sufficient for you. 
And God's grace is always sufficient for the need. Now, we must always realize that the grace that God gives is sufficient for the need of the moment. And we can't look at tomorrow's problems from today's supply of grace. Because we might say, oh, well, I don't have enough. Well, that may be true. But when the problem arises tomorrow, God's grace will be sufficient for the need. Because it's always sufficient for the need. And, uh, and that is how grace is, uh, appears throughout the book of Acts primarily. And so God's grace took material form in the early church, as Luke tells us in verses 34 and 35. He says, For there was not a needy person among them. For all who were owners of land or houses would sell them and bring the proceeds of the sales and lay them at the apostles' feet, and they would be distributed to each as any had need. Now, meeting needs, and I, I thought about this because I thought, well, as any had needs, what are we talking about? Because one must differentiate needs from greeds, right? Mm -hmm. And, of course, uh, you know, we're told in the Scripture that uh, my, Paul says, my God shall supply all of your needs <laughs> according to his riches in Christ Jesus. So meeting needs really meant providing the basics of food and clothing. For example, in James 2, 15 and 16, he says, if a brother or sister is without clothing and in need of daily food. Now that's really the irreducible minimum, isn't it? Uh, as far as getting down to the basic necessities of life. We're talking about food and clothing. But he says, if a brother or sister is without clothing and in need of daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed and be filled, and yet do not give them what is necessary for their body, what use is that? Paul writes in 1 Timothy 6, 8, he says, if we have food and covering, with these, we shall be content. Again, bringing it down to that irreducible minimum. Now, it's fine if God blesses us with more than these things, but we should always learn to be content really with the basics. If I remember correctly, roughly half the world's population right now lives on about $5.50 a day last time I checked. And that's a, that's a pretty small amount. You know, we struggle with issues here in America, but nothing compared to uh, uh, half the people on the planet who are wondering where their next meal is coming from. <clears throat> and so, again, it's fine if God blesses us with more than these things, but we should always be learned to be content with the basics. Now, it is assumed in this passage that those who were in need either lack the ability or opportunity to care for themselves. Biblically, it was expected that if one could work, they should. And you find this throughout the Old and New Testament. Paul says in 2 Thessalonians 3.10 um, that if anyone is not willing to work, neither shall he eat. Okay, so no work means no food. Of course, this assumes that one has the physical and cognitive ability as well as the opportunity. And naturally, a special dispensation would be granted to those who could not help themselves because of a disability. And later, we're told that the apostles in Acts 6, when we get into the first account of a division... Uh, or a, 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 an issue in the church that had to be resolved by means of deacons. But we're told that the apostles were using some of the monetary gifts to help uh, care for widows in the daily serving of food. And so we see how this was applied. Now in Acts 4, 34 and 35, we observe really that God did not provide for the needy by means of supernatural acts, such as manna or money coming down from heaven to provide for them. And we know that he did that with the Israelites in the wilderness, right? And, of course, they're out there in the wilderness of Kadesh Barnea for 40 years, wandering around in a, in a circle <laughs> uh, for 40 years until uh, the Exodus generation, at least those that were 20 years of age and older, died off. And God met their needs from day to day. They had water to drink and food to eat, the manna that fell upon the ground. And their clothes didn't wear out. And so that was God's logistical grace. Uh, that he met their needs in that situation because they didn't have highways to truck in food and that sort of thing. So we know that God can provide, and he did that generation supernaturally. We know we think of Elijah, where birds brought him food to eat, and we see God acting supernaturally, but that's not the case here. So again, we do not see where, where we, what we observe is that God did not provide for the needy by means of supernatural acts, such as man or money coming down from heaven to provide for them. Rather, God chose to meet the needs of the community of believers through his own people, whom he blessed greatly with material wealth. With material wealth. This afforded them the opportunity to step up 
and really serve as conduits of God's grace to help meet the needs of the people around them within the community. Now, these wealthy and open-handed believers served as conduits of grace as they sold their land and houses uh, that were of little personal benefit and gave it to help meet the needs of others. And this is a setup, really. We're about to see a, a wonderful man, a man that I have great admiration for in the Bible, a man named Barnabas, uh, a guy that just, his life and his character just so resonates with me. I mean, there's just so much about him to love and appreciate. And we see the setup here for the introduction to Barnabas in a, in a moment. <clears throat> so these wealthy and open-handed believers served as conduits of his grace as they sold their land and houses, again, that were of little personal benefit, and gave it to help meet the needs of others. In this way, they were really making an investment for their future, as God promises to reward such activities in the eternal state. And we see examples of God promising to offer rewards. You can think of in Matthew 6, even in the Sermon on the Mount, where Jesus says, but when you give to the poor, so assuming that they would, it has to be, a right thing has to be done in a right way. You know, the Pharisees would sound the trumpets and hire a band and do this big uh, presentation thing before they made their announcement and handed, you know, off, you know, some money, whatever amount. But Jesus says, no, he says, you know, do it discreetly. Don't do it for public attention. You're doing it to meet the needs of the person and for, for the glory of God. But he says in Matthew 6, 4, so that your giving will be in secret and your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And you have this concept of rewards appearing throughout the Bible. And as believers, it's fine for us to work for rewards. I mean, works never save. They never have, never will. It's only the work of Christ that saves. And man needs only Christ to be saved. But after salvation, when we enter into phase two of the Christian life, we really should pursue a life of good works because we're called to it, because it, it's, it's an expression of a, our healthy relationship with the Lord, and because we know that we are investing in the eternal state. Now listen, having an investment in time is good wisdom, it's good financial wisdom, but we should really have our eyes on eternity because that's going to be our final destination. And looking forward to that and investing in that by the decisions we make now, uh, I think is very healthy. In fact, Paul even addresses that in 1 Corinthians uh, uh, chapter 3, verses 14 and 15, where he says, If any man's work which he has built on it remains, he will receive a reward. But if any man's work is burned up, that is, if the production of his life was wood, hay, and straw, uh, if the production of his life consisted of uh, low-quality material that was uh, combustible when subject to fire, if it's burned up in the big bonfire in the sky at the great white throne, or not the great white throne, but at the judgment seat of Christ, it says that he will suffer loss. That's not loss of reward and loss of salvation. That's loss of reward, because he says, "But he himself will be saved, yet so as through fire." Now, it's likely that this selling of property really lasted over a period of time. You can't imagine that this happened within like a few hours because it takes time, unless they had short sales back in the day. I don't know. I can't think of any, any such business practices back in the day. So again, we have to assume certain things, that this lasted over a period of time, perhaps even several months. And it was really limited to those who were willing to give of their resources. And meeting the needs of fellow Christians arose from a heart of compassion, not, co not group coercion. The practice of giving to meet the needs of others was wholly voluntary. found this lovely quote by Ryrie. And by the way, he has a great little commentary on Acts, uh, really a useful, useful commentary. If you want a succinct uh, uh, commentary, I, I really enjoy his, his material. Of course, he's known for his succinctness, isn't he, for being concise. But Ryrie says, money talks. And it did in the early church. The fellowship uh, was strengthened and needs were met by the voluntary agreement to hold things in common. He says, this is not Christian communism. The sale of property was quite voluntary. The right of possession was not abolished. The community did not control the money until it had voluntarily been given to the apostles. And the distribution was not made equally, but according to the need. These are not communistic principles. This is Christian charity in its finest display, and he's absolutely right. It is not a sin, by the way, to be wealthy, as God sometimes blesses his people with great wealth, with great riches. He certainly gave great wealth to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob, to Job, to David, and of course to Solomon, among others. And sometimes this wealth came suddenly, 
such as when God liberated the Israelites from Egyptian slavery. And think about this, when they came out of, uh, out of Egyptian slavery, they came out and they, they, they plundered Egypt. I mean, Egypt had been reduced to a third world power by the time God got through with them. Their economy was destroyed, their agriculture was destroyed, their military was destroyed uh, at, the great, uh, you know, at the Red Sea. I mean, they were really reduced to a third world country. Um, but we realize that when they came out, they came out with this abundance of wealth. In fact, in Exodus 3.22, it tells us that, that when they came out, that, that uh, it says, but every woman shall ask of her neighbor and the woman who lives in her house, uh, articles of silver and articles of gold and clothing, and you will put them on yourselves and daughters, and thus you will plunder the Egyptians. Uh, one might almost take this as 400 years of back pay for their years of slavery in Egypt that, in which they were mistreated. Now, afterwards, God gave his people the land of Canaan. So once they go into the land of Canaan, this included cities, houses, wells, vineyards, for which they did not work. Sometimes God gives wealth uh, sometimes suddenly, you think of when they went into the land. It says in uh, Deuteronomy 6, 10, and 11, Then it shall come about when the Lord your God brings you into the land, which he swore to your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and Jacob, to give you great and splendid cities, which you did not build. So they come in, they defeat the people, they destroy the Canaanites, they execute the harim, which was a one-time deal in human history. They didn't do it, and of course we know that's caused them problems. You can read Judges for that. But they were to come in and they were to suddenly take possession of these cities and houses full of good things which you did not fill and hewn cisterns which you did not dig, vineyards and olive trees which you did not plant, and, uh, and so on. But they would suddenly come into possession of this wealth, and God sometimes has a way of doing that. You think of when Abraham suddenly came into wealth in Genesis 14, uh, when he came against, uh, you know, at, when he battled against um, uh, Ketoleomer. And, uh, and there was that defeat, and he finally uh, came to possess great wealth. But the Bible also gives wisdom on how to achieve wealth by hard work and also by investment. So uh, God's Word reveals these things. And so it can come slowly over time. It can, it can suddenly be dropped in your lap. And so we see these wealthy believers in the early church who, again, are giving of their own resources. So it's worth noting that in the early church, some wealthy Christians, by the way, continued to own homes, uh, which shows that the selling of property was really limited to those who were willing, because I thought about this too. For example, in Acts 12, we're told about Mary, who used her home for godly purposes by opening it for Christians to gather and pray. Because we're told that in Acts 12, 12, and when he realized this, he went to the house of Mary. So she continues to possess this house. It's not like they just simply gave up everything. Not only that, but in the next verse, we're told that Mary had a servant girl named Rhoda who functioned as her maid. Um, so again, this implies continued possession of wealth. It's not like they bankrupted themselves. It's not like they put themselves in poverty and then, you know, walked around destitute. In Acts 16, we're also told about a wealthy woman named Lydia who was a business owner and who was a seller of purple fabrics and later opened her home to Paul and to Silas, again, own, having the possession of this home. And she used it for ministry purposes, uh, to help God's people and for purposes of prayer. Of course, a, a really interesting passage is in the Gospel of Luke where we learn where some wealthy women uh, had financially supported Jesus and his disciples, namely Mary, who was called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had gone out, and Joanna, the wife of Cusa, Herod's steward, and Susanna, and many others who were contributing to their support out of their private means. I mean, talk about a, an investment in eternity. I mean, supporting the Lord and his disciples during their time of ministry, right? Uh, and so again, they, they did not cease to be wealthy, but use their wealth ultimately for God's purposes. So I know some whom God has gifted with great business acumen, and these he has blessed with power to make wealth. And these same skilled men and women have been generous in their giving to help others, and in this way have followed Paul's instruction in 1 Timothy 6, uh, that to those who are rich in this present world, not to be conceited or to set their hope on the uncertainty of riches, but on God, who richly supplies us with all things to enjoy and to do good and to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share. And we see this uh, going on in the early church. So being wealthy can be a blessing from the Lord, but how one handles that wealth either honors or dishonors him. 
And of course, Proverbs 22, 1 tells us that a good name is to be more desired than great wealth, and favor is better than silver and gold. The healthy Christian heart is one that looks for needs in others and then seeks to meet them. Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 10, 24, let no one seek his own good but that of his neighbor. And in 1 Corinthians 13, 5, that love does not seek its own interests but the interests of others. And of course, Philippians 2, 4, which says, do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. This is the healthy Christian attitude. And we see the early church demonstrating this when they were willing to give open-handedly to meet the needs of others uh, within the Christian community. And personally, I wonder if I lost everything I own and were reduced to the basics of food and clothing, would I be content? It's hard for me not to think about this on a very personal level. Would I trust the Lord, knowing and accepting that God works all things together for, for the good to those who love him, to those who are called according to his purpose? Would I obey the biblical directives to rejoice always, pray without ceasing, and, and in everything give thanks, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus? Would I do all things without complaining or disputing? Well, you could apply that to almost every situation in life, right? Would I acknowledge God's sovereignty over my life, realizing that the Lord makes poor and rich, that he brings low and he also exalts? And would I praise him like Job, who said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I shall return there. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. The truth is, we brought nothing into the world, so we cannot take anything out of it either. And it helps produce mental and emotional stability if we hold loosely the material things of this life, realizing that God owns everything and that we are but stewards of what he's provided. Now let's meet this great man called Barnabas. In the closing verses of this pericope, Luke introduces us briefly to Barnabas, who will play a, an important role in the development of the early church. Luke wrote in Acts 4, 36 and 37, it says, Now Joseph, a Levite of Cyprian birth, who was also called Barnabas by the apostles, which translated means son of encouragement, and who owned a tract of land, sold it and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. Now, according to the Mosaic law, Levites were not to own land. Uh, they were not to own any portion uh, of the land. Uh, in Israel, but Joseph was from the island of Cyprus, and so apparently they could own land outside of Israel, and Luke tells us that he owned a tract of land on the island. Now, here's a, a bit of a conundrum, a problem. The name Barnabas uh, probably derives from uh, Barnabi, uh, actually means son of a prophet, so one raises the question, how do you get the name Barnabi or Barnabas and have it translated mean son of encouragement? And, you know, you read, you know, different uh, scholarly works and everybody's kind of scratching their head on this. And so the question among some Bible scholars is how this could translate as son of encouragement. I think Paul helps us here when he spoke of the, when he spoke to prophets at the church of Corinth in 1 Corinthians 14, 31, he tells them he, to the prophets, he says, for you can all prophesy one by one so that, so that all may learn and all may be encouraged. And there he links the function of a prophet with that of encouragement. So the idea is that a prophet of the Lord would function as one who encouraged others to walk with the Lord and to remain faithful to him. And I think in that sense, that's the significance of the function of a prophet. Now, concerning Barnabas' character, Luke describes him as a godly man who was noted for his encouragement and willingness to give of his own resources for the benefit of others. And here the word encouragement translates the Greek noun paraklesis, which according to Badag, uh, denotes emboldening another in belief or course of action, encouragement, exhortation, lifting of another's spirit. I love that. I love that, that idea, and that is such a strong biblical idea, this idea of encouragement, of building other people up, of edifying them. In fact, the word edify itself comes from a compound Greek word, oikoidome, oikos house, dome to build, and it speaks of building somebody up. And listen, we need that. None of us are impervious to the pressures of life or being discouraged from day to day, and having somebody that can come and be that encourager, man, I'll tell you, that'll charge your battery. I mean, that is such a blessing in the church. And I thought about that it, it seems really that Barnabas' life reflected what he saw in his relationship with God. 
And I think that what we see in Barnabas is really that reflection of his relationship with God. And just like in 1 John, John says, we love, why? Because he first loved us. And when the vertical is in proper alignment, when, when you're in that right relationship with God and you are enjoying the love of God, it's easier for that love to flow outwardly to other people. I think that's true of grace as well. In the scripture, we learn that God the Father is, is described as the God of all grace, that he sits upon a throne of grace, that he gives grace to the afflicted and provides salvation by grace through faith in Jesus. Jesus himself is said to be full of grace and truth, and the Holy Spirit is called the Spirit of grace. Grace, from the Greek word kodos, is undeserved favor. It is the love, mercy, or kindness that one person freely confers upon another who does not deserve it. And of course, there is nothing more powerful or encouraging than God's grace to warm and to motivate his people to action. For what flows down from God to his children when received with an open heart, will find natural outward expression to others who will encourage one another and build up one another and will encourage one another day after day, as Hebrews tells us. And I believe that Barnabas was one who drank deeply from the well of God's grace and goodness and being blessed and encouraged by the Lord was motivated to do the same to others. And Barnabas' first act of encouragement was witnessed in his willingness to give of his own resources for the benefit of others. Specifically, we are told that he owned a tract of land and sold it and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. Being a man of grace, he sold his property and gave it to the apostles to be used for ministry purposes. <clears throat> Later in Acts, we're told that, Barnabas at, uh, that, that the church at Jerusalem sent Barnabas to Antioch and when he arrived and witnessed the grace of God, there's that grace of God again. I love that. You'll see that throughout. But when he arrived and witnessed the grace of God, it says that he rejoiced and began to encourage them all with a resolute heart to remain true to the Lord. And here the word encourage translates that Greek verb parakaleo, which means to call to one side. The picture is that of one person who comes alongside another and encourages them uh, to accomplish a task or finish a race. In this case, it meant encouraging these Christians to press on and to do God's will. Encouraging others to remain true to the Lord is really what healthy Christian encouragement looks like, uh, to remain true to the Lord. And Barnabas was pivotal to the early church as seen in other passages. For example, it was Barnabas who supported Paul shortly after his conversion, even though others had reservations about him. It was Barnabas who bridged the relationship between the church in Jerusalem and the church in Antioch. It was Barnabas who connected with Paul and formed a teaching ministry in Antioch that lasted for a year. It was Barnabas, along with Paul, who was entrusted to deliver a financial donation to suffering Christians in Judea. It was Barnabas who helped launch the first significant missionary journey into the Gentile world. It was Barnabas who helped resolve the first major theological issue facing the church. We're going to see this guy throughout. He is, a, he is a pivotal player. And it was Barnabas who supported Mark even after he'd failed. And unfortunately, his support resulted in a major conflict with Paul that resulted in their breaking fellowship for a while. And by the way, believers can have disagreements, even sharp disagreements that can break fellowship. However, from later biblical passages, we know that Barnabas and Paul, men who were both known for their grace and love, reconciled their differences and were reunited in fellowship and ministry. And I think that's really what, what makes them stand out. It's not that believers don't have disagreements and even sharp disagreements that sometimes bring about a separation. But what you see, what really marks them as mature and being uh, gracious is that they come back together and they seek forgiveness, they seek reconciliation. And I think we see that between Paul and Barnabas. Now, overall, Barnabas was noted as being an encourager, a good man, one who was full of the Holy Spirit and of faith, and one who risked his life for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Barnabas was not without his flaws. However, he possessed the qualities one would like to see in a Christian leader as he sought to build the Christian community by means of grace, love, and solid biblical instruction. Churches and Christians need people like Barnabas who will stand with them, give them wise counsel, and encourage them in their walk with the Lord. Now, though some wealthy Christians in the early church uh, uh, had a right attitude about wealth and really operated with humility and grace to meet the needs of fellow Christians such as Barnabas, uh, 
What follows, what follows in the next chapter reveals that some had impure hearts and suffered from approbation lust. They sought the approval of man rather than the approval of God. And so, uh, whereby deceit, they sought again the approval of others rather than God. And these paid a heavy price for their sin. Of course, I'm anticipating where Leon's going to go uh, next week in Acts chapter 5. So, a quick summary of this section that we've covered today. In the early church, the early church really had a sense of Christian community within itself. And those, uh, and those who had wealth voluntarily shared with those who were in need. Love was the motivation for sharing, as there was no command from heaven and no human pressure from the church leadership to give. What we see in this passage is much of what we see throughout the book of Acts. It's descriptive, not prescriptive. And passages like Acts 4, uh, 32 to 37 really provide an ideal picture of what the church should look like in its everyday functions. And so that is going to close out this section, these few verses. Uh, do we have any questions about this section of Scripture? Yes, sir. Uh, so you brought up a good point in Levi's own property. Out of curiosity, do you know if the tribal allotment is still in effect and how the transaction from a, a person and land they might have had were they still following the Mosaic law at that time that said that that would be returned um, if I, okay, so if I, okay, so you're asking, uh, was the Mosaic law still in effect such that someone like Joseph would have been uh, adhering to that? Okay, uh, we know from Hebrews 8, 13, uh, Romans 6, 14, other passages that, the, that the, after the death of Christ that the Mosaic law has been rendered obsolete and that we are now under the law of Christ. I don't think they fully understood that. I think later on when you get into Acts where Peter has a hard time even accepting, you know, the Lord's directions to go to a Gentile and, uh, you know, three times tells the Lord no. And Peter has a way of, uh, you know, there's something about three in Peter that just seems to go together when he's, when he's failing because uh, he doesn't just fail, you know, once or twice. I mean, he really puts a bow on it, you know. Um, but I, I think they're transitioning at this time. Now, whether or not he was obedient to the law, up to that time or whether or not he fully understood, uh, we don't know, uh, we're, we're not sure. Uh, but I think when one looks at the uh, directive that was set forth in, the, in Numbers that uh, forbid them from owning land in, in, in within the nation, within Israel, uh, I don't think that excludes land outside of that. And, um, and it, that's an argument from silence, I get it, but, but the text tells us uh, whether he was obedient to the Lord or not under the law as he understood it or would have been compliant, um, the text simply tells us that he owned a tract of land uh, in Cyprus. And so it was understood that he sold that land. Now, you know, did he have to, you know, did he have to get on a ship and travel there? Did he have somebody he could communicate with? Again, we think about the process of all that. But uh, it, it just simply tells us what he did, you know, and so we're limited as far as that. So I don't know that I could really expand more than that. I don't even know if I answered your question or not. <laughs> yeah, I guess beyond beyond him and the Levi, uh -huh. in general, those who are giving land, these are all Jews, and based on Mosaic law, you don't ever permanently give away land. Right. Now, again, I see that point, too, because you, you could, it, in effect, what you were doing was leasing it out, uh, because the land ultimately came back to you, which I love that. I wish we did that here in America, that we don't, uh, you know, it, because there's a tax system. You never fully own your land, is what the, that boils down to. Uh, I'll try to avoid going too far into that, but, um, but you're right on that. So in this case, I think because the land was, it was a tract of land in Cyprus, I think once he did sell it, I think that was... I think that was done. I don't think that was something that he could have retrieved. So, any other questions or comments? Good question, by the way. All right, let's pray. Dear Father, we thank you for this day, for this time of fellowship and study in your word. We thank you for this interesting passage and this uh, description of what happened in the early church with this love and this graciousness and this open-handedness that these believers who had means were willing to give of their own resources uh, to meet the needs within the church, within the body of Christ, as it, was, as it was developing at that time. And we are also thankful for the introduction of this man, Barnabas, who was so pivotal in the early church. 
And Father, we are just uh, thankful for men like him who are not only gracious and open-handed uh, in their giving, but also men who were uh, noted, a man who was noted for his being an encouragement to others. And Father, we just thank you for this day. We pray that as we think on these things, that we will be challenged uh, to apply truths to our life and to grow thereby. We ask this now in Christ's name. Amen. Amen.